Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and today we have something that's really exciting, and that is the next installment in our project Tiny Mini Micro, and that's going to focus around this thing. And this specifically is the Dell Optiplex 3070 Micro. And you might be saying to yourself, hey, isn't Project Tiny Mini Micro only for used systems, secondhand systems, all that kind of stuff? Why are you doing a current generation review? Well, this particular unit we got directly from Dell and it was only $333, I think, which is really reasonable. So something I wanted to show in this review is that although some of the systems that we're looking at are a little bit older, we're also going to look at some of the current generation systems. And I want to give you some idea of what you can expect with any of them. And after having gotten this unit, I actually think that it was one of the better values of all of the 20 plus units that we've purchased to this point. Before we get into the rest of the review, I wanted to talk a little bit about just how mature and how awesome these little systems are. And a really good example of that is we pulled the hard drive and this did come with a hard drive out of the system because, well, we needed a coaster for our drinks and we're not gonna use a hard drive in a system in 2020, but we pulled it out and all of a sudden we got a warning message when we turned on the machine saying, hey, your hard drive is dead. And that is an awesome feature because it at least gives you a way to start the remediation process like calling and getting your warranty taken care of. But this didn't just stop at a warning message. Instead, we got a little beep. And then we hit the fun part, which is there's a little Dell, your hard drive died jingle that we end up seeing. Oh yeah, that's right. That's a your hard drive died jingle along with an LED light show that encompasses both the power LED as well as the keyboard LED. I mean, there are a lot of features in these machines that you just don't see when you build your own PC because, well, Dell and all the other vendors have a lot of engineering behind it, such as making these fun little tones and light shows when you have a hard drive failure. So let's talk really quickly about some of the key specs. So first off, this is an Intel-based system. This particular one is a ninth generation, so this has a Core i3-9100T, which is a 35-watt TDP processor. Now there is another version that I think Dell may have added later, but they, you can get a Core i5-9500T. And the big difference between those two is the Core i3 is a four core, four thread part, whereas the Core i5 is a six core, six thread part. So you get 50% more cores in the i5 version. Now, when we look at the front of the unit, what we actually see is something that's pretty simple. It's a pretty simple layout, really. I mean, you have a headphone jack, you have a microphone jack, you also have two USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, so you can get pretty high-speed devices hooked in directly there. Now, in the back of the unit, there's two display outputs. There's standard, a display port output, as well as a HDMI output. Now, we also have the Dell Optiplex 7070 Mini, and that actually has two display ports as standard. So one of the nice things that you get with the 3070 over some of the higher-end units is that you actually do get that HDMI port. And you may say, well, all my monitors are display ports, so why would I want that? And a really good reason is because you can just use a native HDMI to HDMI connection for something like a television if you're going to go put this somewhere that you know you want to have a stealth lab that you're just kind of setting up as a home theater media PC. This is a really good example of a feature that seems like a small one, but it just kind of makes cabling a little easier because you don't need to get that adapter. One thing that our unit didn't have, but it is an option, is that you can get a third display output or you can also get a serial console port. Now in our 7070 micro, we actually had the serial output and so we can kind of show you what that looks like, but that optional LOM could actually be another HDMI port, it could be a display port, VGA port, there's a whole bunch of different options that you could put there. Moving on to USB, you're gonna see that we have two USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports and we also have two USB 2 ports. Now, that is something a little bit different because inside the 7030 Micro, we actually have a H370, an Intel H370 chipset. Now that H370 chipset that's in the 3070 is not as high end as what you'd find in the 5070 or 77 Micros that use the Q370 chipset. There are a couple differences in terms of PCIe lanes, but just kind of given the form factor, those aren't as big of a deal in these kinds of systems. The big one that is a deal, or at least there are two things that are a really big deal about the different chipsets. And the first thing is that you get fewer USB 3 ports 
on the H370 chipset. And the other thing that you do not get is you do not get the ability to support vPro. So the Dell 3070 Micro does not have vPro support and you're just not gonna find that on any of the units. Now, some people don't want vPro support, so that's perfectly fine. Some really do want that feature. So if you do, don't get this unit. You're also gonna see a one gig networking port. Now that one gig networking port is a real tech, I think it's a 8111 NIC. So that's something that you can look up in terms of compatibility for your OSs. Now it's a really common NIC, so it's supported in most major OSs. Of course, if you're using something like VMware, well, you know, it's a real tech NIC and you're using VMware, so you're gonna run into that. Something our review unit had that a lot of units did not have is we actually have a Qualcomm wireless solution. And because of that, we have, I think it's a one by one 802.11 AC solution that also has Bluetooth 4.1 in it. It's by Qualcomm. Now there are two different kinds of basically wireless radios that these micro units use in this generation. And so there are two different Qualcomm chipsets. One is a one by one, one's a two by two, and they also have Bluetooth and all that. There's also an Intel option. If you do get the Intel option on the higher end units, that would be what you would get for vPro, but on the 3070, most of them are just Qualcomm units anyway. Now the 3070 is not standard with Wi-Fi, So ours has that and we got it with it, but it's not something that is a standard feature. So that's something to look out for. Opening the unit is super easy. You have literally one thumb screw and then the unit is open. And inside we can see a fairly easy to service unit. I mean, just to give you some idea, this hard drive, two and a half inch SATA hard drive tray just pops out. So you don't even need any tools. You hit these two little latches, pop it out, super easy. And then this is the whole heat sink and fan shroud assembly. And you just push these two little latches right here, pull it out and you're done. Overall, the only things that you really need to use a screwdriver to service in this entire thing are if you actually have to go and access the CPU socket or you have to access the M.2 ports. So for internal storage, what you have is you have a two and a half inch drive tray, which is a SATA drive tray. It's super easy to install. You have little feet that plug into this blue carrier, and then you basically just slide it in and it works without any tools, it's just retained in place. Very easy. Underneath that, there are two M.2 slots, and one of them is really meant for wireless radio. So I think it's an M.2 2230 slot. And so it's a much shorter slot really in our unit. It's actually housing the Qualcomm 802.11ac module, but in a lot of these systems, it's gonna be barren. The main M.2 slot is actually a M.2, it takes up to 2280, but you can put smaller drives in there as well, but there's a 2280 slot. So that way you can put in most kind of normal NVMe SSDs. Now, I will say that when we look at some of the other units that we have that actually came with an SSD, those tend to be things like DRAMless SSDs, cashless SSDs like the Toshiba now Kyokushia BG4. And so those are the types of SSDs that they're really putting in there. They're not really putting like the really high performance SSDs. So that's just something to keep in mind when it comes to cooling, because this doesn't necessarily have a whole bunch of active cooling in this area. So you are gonna need a cooler running SSD if you're gonna put an NVMe SSD in it. One other kind of interesting note that I think a lot of people just don't know about this machine but you can actually use Intel Optane memory technology with it. We didn't try it, but it's actually in the spec sheet and in the manual that that is a supported feature. So that's kind of interesting if you want to look at something like that. I think most of our readers won't, but it's an option. I did kind of glance over this, but you will notice that our unit actually came with a 500 gigabyte, two and a half inch Toshiba hard drive. I have absolutely no idea in 2020 what one would do with a 500 gigabyte, two and a half inch hard drive. Um, it's gonna be replaced by an SSD. And then that hard drive is going to, I have no idea what's gonna to happen to it, but I can tell you it's not gonna stay in this machine. Frankly, a 512 gig or even down to let's say a 400 gig SSD, you can generally get those in the 10 cents a gigabyte range. So they're really, you know, in the 40 to $60 range. So it's a pretty inexpensive upgrade if you want to do it yourself versus getting one from Dell. The other option that you have is you can add another NVMe SSD if you want instead of this, and you can use this as maybe a storage drive or whatever you want, but we're just not going to use it, but it did come with the system. Now, while the HPE units will actually have a little fold up so you can actually get into the SODIMM slots, the Dell unit, you have to take off the entire shroud. It's really pretty easy, so it's not a big deal. 
but it is a little bit of a difference. Now, one of the other kind of interesting things about it is that you do get two SODIM slots. The lower end configurations of these systems have four gigabytes of memory. Ours came with eight gigabytes. And one of the nice things that we saw was that this particular configuration came with a single eight gigabyte DIMM. Now, having a single DIMM on one hand is really not the best because that means that you're running in single channel memory mode, and that's really not the most optimal way to go. Now, these DDR4 SODIMs are fairly inexpensive, and you can get an 8 gig DDR4 SODIM on the market for about 25 bucks these days. And so the plan with this is basically to add a second 8 gigabyte DIM, and we did that and it worked fine. The CPU itself, again, is the Core i3-9100T. Now, we did do a review of the Core i3-9100F, which didn't have a GPU, but it did have a higher TDP. This is only a 35 watt TDP part, but it does have the internal GPU. So if you do want to use a feature like Quick Assist or something that's accelerated by that GPU, you can. So the Core i3-9100 performance is actually pretty good. It's not necessarily up to what we would see some of the Xeon E type workstation parts, or even the kind of mainstream desktop parts of the Core i3, i5, i7 series that we would see normally. But at the same time, it's no slouch of a processor. And remember, this is only 35 watt TDP part. Because it's a lower power part, that means you can use a smaller power brick. So you use a pretty standard little Dell 65 watt power brick. And it's pretty small, pretty easy to hide anywhere you want to and doesn't take up much space. And they're really easy to replace because they sell a gajillion of these a year. Typical power is what we've been seeing in most of these units in the basically nine to 12 watt range. Now with the hard drive, we could get to go a little bit higher, but with SSDs, you're gonna see that idle stay pretty low. And then in terms of typical usage, I think you know we saw some maximums usually in our testing in the probably 40-ish watt range was pretty common. Now you can get up into the 60-ish watt range if you have this thing fully loaded, but that just kind of gives you an idea in terms of just how much power these things can pull. They're not gonna pull as much as kind of a standard desktop that you might see in a gaming desktop or something like that. The other thing is that that idle power consumption is much lower than if you have a traditional server. So if you had a, say a Xeon D or a Xeon E server board and you're kind of using this as a server, well, this actually has lower idle power consumption because you don't have a baseboard management controller using somewhere between four and six watts. Four to six watts to a lot of people doesn't sound like a ton, but remember that if the idle is somewhere in the nine to 12 watt range, that four to six watt actually can jump that idle power consumption up quite a bit. There are a couple other features of this system that I just wanted to point out because you might be looking at this and saying, okay, you have like a $122 CPU, you have maybe a $25 stick of RAM, you have a hard drive that's basically a, I don't know, maybe we're going to use it as a coaster or something like that. I have no idea what we're going to use it for. But, you know, there's some value in all this kind of stuff, but it seems like maybe it's not as good of a value as some of the other options. Well, there are a couple extra value adds that we got. The first value add, which is really important, is that this actually came with Windows 10 Pro. Now, getting a Windows 10 Pro license by itself, we'll put an Amazon affiliate link in the description, but they generally go for somewhere in the $140 range. Sometimes they go higher than that, but you know that's actually a very good value, especially remember this is like a $333-ish device. So getting a $140 license is actually a pretty good value. One other little tip and trick that we have with these is that our unit actually came configured with a keyboard and a mouse. Now these are just the absolute cheapest, not fancy Dell chiclet keyboard and two button mouse that you could possibly have. I mean, they're basic functionality. They're not much more than that. But on the other hand, if you delete those from the configuration, I think it saves you like maybe $15 total. And while these aren't necessarily the fanciest keyboards or anything like that, sometimes it's nice to just have an extra keyboard and mouse laying around in case you ever need one. So for $330 total, I totally think that getting an extra $15 keyboard or mouse was totally worth it. Now, as part of Project Tiny Mini Micro, I also kind of want to go and give an idea of one thing that we learned from buying each system. Well, some of the configuration stuff was actually pretty interesting in this one. There is one bit that I wanted to cover that I think is even more important than those little configuration nuances, and that is warranty. For $333, we didn't just get the system. We also got a warranty for three years that includes on-site service after remote diagnostics. But think about that. For $333, if something goes wrong in the next three years on this machine, Dell is going to dispatch someone to come and fix it. 
That's awesome. And that's something that frankly, you don't get with the Intel NUX. While the Intel NUX are very trendy and they're very cool, we use them all the time. Raspberry Pis, very cool, we use those all the time as well. The idea of having someone just come out and fix a system for us if it's broken and not have to go deal with like sending it in and all that kind of stuff is actually kind of nice. Now it might not be worth $500 by itself, but it's certainly worth something to be able to say, oh, well, if something goes wrong, somebody will come and fix it for me. That's kind of cool. So our key project tiny mini micro takeaway from this unit is that you can actually go shop around. And if you're willing to wait and look for discounts and just kind of wait till these things go on sale, you can actually find some pretty good deals and get features that you can't get in other product segments like on-site warranty and support. Now, of course, we're gonna have more information. So if you wanna look up some of the more specifics, go check out the STH main site. We're gonna link that article in the description so you can find it really easily and go check out in this in all more detail. We just can't go over everything in video format because otherwise we do in like a two hour video and nobody wants to watch that. If you like this video, why don't you click subscribe, turn on those notifications because we're going to have like 20 more of these Project Tiny Mini Micro node reviews that we're going to go do videos on. And so if you turn on notifications, you'll be able to see whenever we do put one out. Thanks again for watching and have an awesome day.